My name's Becky. My name's Jasper. If you like, like this video, video hit, hit like, comment, comment subscribe. subscribe. Join, Join the, the peanut, peanut gallery. gallery. All right, hey, hey uh, well, welcome here. Patrick has the weirdest uh, intro things before the clap, so he throws us all off and we don't know what we're saying. But we are back, Peanut Gallery. Linda, welcome here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, are you nervous? I am. She promised it would be awkward, so we'll, we'll see how this all goes. I probably will deliver on that. Uh, the, <laughs> 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 so Linda is one of the uh, people that we have met over the last, uh, that we've known for a lot of years, but kind of got to know a lot better through this whole process of being on the Mac board together. Right. And you are actually El Presidente right now. That's right. You are the all big, hail the, the big chief. chief. The yeah. big all cheese is what they the say. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we are very thankful that you took some time to be here with us today. Um, and so we've been going through kind of these initial ones. We're, we're talking about the athletic center that we've been working on. And we wanted to interview some of our board members, kind of why you care about this project, why you got on board and who you are. Because uh, one of the things that we uh, when we started this podcast a couple of years ago, we really felt strongly about was that there is too much hatred and mm -hmm. a lot of that stems from the fact that people don't sit down and talk. And as you begin to talk with people, even if their beliefs are different, even if they come at it from different perspectives, um, you can have a way of actually enjoying being together and getting to know each other. And there's a lot more we have in common than we have difference. And so that's part of our goal. And as we've done that, we've met a bunch of people and you are one of them. And so we asked you to show up. And so nobody is here to hear me talk. They're here for you. This so. is great. And that's a very noble cause. And I agree. Um, division is is large, and we have a lot more in common than we think. And sports is definitely a common unifier. So. Right, absolutely. So what yeah, I was listening to uh, this is completely off topic, but it's my podcast, so we can do what we want. I was lot. listening to uh, Jean Chrétien um, talk <laughs> yesterday. Oh, she went again. <laughs> I did. Not, I did not do that. No, um, no problem so, with the golf course. Little Jean Chrétien. <laughs> yeah. So he was talking about Brian Mulroney, and so they were on the opposite sides of mm. politics. And so the interviewer had asked him about what that is like. And he mm. just said, you know, it's so healthy to have people who have different opinions. And I respected him because he was doing his best for Canada. And even if I didn't agree with him, we both knew we were fighting for something that was bigger than ourselves. And I thought that was really cool. That is cool. And I think that's kind of a bit lost in politics and it's a bit lost yeah. in social media. But the idea being that we're all trying to create a better community. We're all trying to create a place that's better for our kids and leave it better for them and for right. our grandkids. For those of us that have grandkids ready. Woo! <coughs> so who was who is the right hand <laughs> man for Jean Cachin? Do you remember? No idea. Come on. No, I don't Finance know. Minister <laughs> Paul hey, Martin. There you go. You know yes. what? Arguably I'm the greatest impressed. duo in political Canadian history. That uh, they they oversaw what would be the Canadian comeback. They what? Two thirds star debt during that time oversaw rapid <laughs> expansion I of the should, Canadian economy. I shouldn't phenomenal, have brought this up. I have no idea what you're saying. Phenomenal political leader. And so, so did a great job for Canada. The podcast? Who's sponsoring the podcast? This is <laughs> brought to you by the Liberal Party. <laughs> of it's hilarious because we're, we're we're in like the heartbeat of conservative. Like, uh, no, I just thought it was no, a big shout out. They did a good uh, job. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, and uh, it was super interesting listening to him talk about it. But yeah. unity. So uh, let's talk a little bit. Who are you, Linda? You grew up in the area. You're from around here. Uh, tell us a bit about, uh, about kind of who you are and how you ended up here. For sure. So I'm a first-generation Canadian, born and raised in Chihuahua, Mexico, one of five kids. And uh, we have a cool story. We, we immigrated because uh, our section of Mexico was going through a little bit of an economic recession. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So parents packed us up with an infant and then hightailed it to Canada with $500. Wow. And so no stranger to hard work, but humble beginnings obviously made the dream work and here we are today. How'd you guys end up here? So we had family in the area yep. and the first time we came for me, speaking for myself, it was summer and beautiful. And then when we came and we actually experienced Canadian winters, I did have a moment of regret. <laughs> so moral of the story How is, bad was the economy again? <laughs> if you really want to move someplace, maybe don't visit in their prime season, go on the <laughs> off season to really get a feel for it. So how old were you when you guys came out here? I was 10. 10. And so then did you guys start as like immigrant workers where you kind of just stayed the summer and went back or did you guys just make the full plunge stayed here permanently? Great question. We actually were seasonal initially just to kind of feel it out. And then we just made the plum, the plummet. Did you, what did plummet? you say? The plunge. plunge. There way. we go. That's Either a better way. word. We made the plunge. So what was that like? Cause so a lot of us, and maybe you don't remember what those summers were like. Oh, I remember. Okay. <laughs> I, I assumed you would, but we've never talked about this before. Right. So 
Um, because my journey didn't, I moved here when we were so young and stayed here that we didn't have any of that back and forth, but we see a lot of families do that and often wonder what that's like as a child experiencing that. So what was your experience with that? So I don't know if my experience was unique, but anytime we went back to Mexico, we were the cool kids for the moment because we had just gotten back from Canada Mm. and we only knew a few English words, but it made us really cool. (laughs) Even though they didn't know that we didn't know what we were saying, we just sounded really cool. Um, but I do remember actually making the move and it being quite terrifying because you left everything behind, all your friends, and this was going to be official. You were not going to go back and forth this time around. You were going to settle in and make it right. work. Right. And then you're always the odd one out with a bit of a language barrier. I don't know how much I've gotten past that. Apparently yeah. my English is quite broken still <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, but no, it was it was scary, but also exciting at the same time. Okay. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. I think there's a... Uh... That's a story that I think a lot of us growing up in this region, um, as my phone is ringing and distracting me here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, everything's off. How am I getting calls? Anyways. Oh, airplane mode. It's an iPhone 13 sorry. thing. Sorry. I'm, a, I'm 40 now. I feel, I feel lost with some technology still. I'm sorry. Um, but no, a lot of us saw, you know, people coming up here working for the summer and stuff. Um, and then you wonder. But I, I think there's also a lot of negative connotation from people who had no clue. Right. And who felt like it was really, you know, a poor thing for their parents to do to bring. And so there is some of that. Right. But I think there was also a piece of it where a lot of families felt that way, where there was nothing in Mexico. Right. And so you were able to work. Yeah, you worked oh my really goodness. hard when we you worked were here. Hard. But then that gave you the ability to live. Absolutely. Right. And yeah. so it was, I think there was a lot of farmers who probably took advantage of that. But then I think there was a lot of farmers who really did well, uh, really in providing for families. And we they don't did. think about it often that way. Yeah. You, when you send money to, you know, a compassion child mm-hmm. or something like that, it feels right, but somehow this felt wrong, and so right. I think, for a lot of people. So it's kind of neat to hear. I, I didn't know that that had been part of your experience. Yeah, but. no. And like you said, some some took advantage of it, but sure. others were very helpful and got us set up with a family doctor, as an example, or a dentist, and just made sure that we had proper clothing to wear because yeah. we, we weren't used to the the harsh winter weathers. In fact, my first pair of winter boots were so warm at home that I didn't bother putting on socks when I went to school. And I actually got in trouble for that. (laughs) And I didn't understand why until we went out at recess and my toes turned blue. And then I realized, ah, this is why we were supposed Uh, to bring socks. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Did you guys ever um, interact with MCS or Mennonite Community Services? Do you have any history? Because, again, that's another organization that, we know is in Elmer, but right. very few people know. But this is, do. you guys would be a target um, family for them to really help navigate, right? Did you guys have interaction yeah, with them? Yeah, we did. We were very blessed by them. Uh, my mom actually got her landed through the help of MCS and then later on her full citizenship. So we are very grateful for MCS and what they did. Okay. And then they also hooked us up with some thrifted jackets. So yep. we were very grateful for that. Yeah. Uh, especially since we were a little bit oblivious to how harsh Canadian winters right. could in fact be. I mean, no longer is that the case. We had two cold days this I know, year so right? far. It's, it has not been. But no, that, that's very cool. Okay, so you grew up here. You stayed here. Um, Got married I, here. So I, I know your husband. I have stories about your husband. I definitely want to hear some of these stories. <laughs> <laughs> no, we probably had some good years of tobacco together. Um, it was, uh, we, had, we had fun. We had fun. I don't know if our, our boss cared for our fun as much as we cared oh, we for our fun. We should get Gary a sympathy card. We should send Gary a sympathy <laughs> card. No, but it, it was good. So I never got to know you, but so you grew up, you went to school here, you would do university because right now you, you're a bank manager. So that's you're, correct. You're kind of a big deal. Oh, so I wouldn't kinda, say <laughs> How do you, how do you backtrack? Cause that's, that was kind of our connection, right? Right. Through banking and that's through, right. Cause you guys do a lot of charity work with FCA and some other yeah. organizations. So we kind of cross paths. Um, but how, how do you get into the banking world? Um, and what does that look like? I don't know how much time you have. <laughs> um, no, in, I went to, um, uh, Parkside for high school because we lived in Union area for the most okay. part while we were here. Oh, so you're a St. Thomas kid. St. Thomas okay. kid. That's right. That's fine. Um, don't hold it against me. No, I do. Um, I'm but... you're wearing a New York hat to begin <laughs> with. You're a St. Thomas kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's why I waited to tell you this till now. <laughs> you know, can't go back on our agreement here. Um, no, so sports was a big part of high school, but um, I actually went into health and fitness. So I went to okay. Fanshawe for that, took a lot of kinesiology courses. And then for years, I actually did personal training. And then, um, I don't know if you know, but if you want to make it big in personal training, you have to be available 
evenings and weekends, and it's not conducive to raise a family. Right. So we made a. a I, don't, I don't know what part of me you think is familiar <laughs> with a personal trainer. Can you stand up and demonstrate <laughs> that? <laughs> I always thought you worked out. Can you stand? Fit, you know? I, you know what? I don't know how I brought that up. Carry on. I, we'll I, get back to sports. I want to get back to sports nicely, sure. yet, but carry that's on. That's no problem. This. Yeah. So that's um, so essentially, I stopped personal training, became a stay at home mom until our kids were old enough to start school. And I basically told Eddie, my husband, that um, I was going to do one career path or the other extreme. One of them was going to be go back to school and become a nurse and have crazy hours or become a banker and have banker's hours. And so I'm glad I chose option B. It worked out really well. Started off as a casual teller. It was called Mennonite Savings and Credit Union at the mm -hmm. time. And then what drew me there was the faith community and their value centeredness. Yep. And then just from there, learned more, got educated, um, took opportunities as they opened. And then I managed the front line. And then when the branch manager position came became available, I took it. Okay. So it's now a year and three months since I took the branch manager position. Okay. Well, good for you. Good so thing. far, so good. So far, so good. The banking world's good. You know, it, and it's interesting as I have gotten to, you know, I was thinking about Paul with, you know, wanting Canadian Tire and some of these different yeah. positions. Going through high school, we only thought there were like four career options, <laughs> right? You could go into emergency services, a doctor, a lawyer, or like trades. And that was it. That's right. And then yeah. as you go out now, you're like, there are so many options. And so I've been trying to tell that to my kids. Like, there are so many options, but... Then I feel like sometimes you're going to those restaurants that have like 400 pages of menu and you're like, yeah. could you just give me five? That's right. <laughs> I don't know what to yeah, It's too many choices. Right. Okay. So why did you join um, in with our athletic center team? So I wouldn't have actually gotten to know you guys unless you had come to the bank. So I was really grateful for that as far as the Malhide Athletic mm -hmm. Center goes. I do know you from from your priming time with with my husband. Uh, and then <laughs> seeing you in the and community. Also, please, <laughs> a, a disclaimer, if Gary ever does listen, I was not a good primer. Um, I was not that coordinated with my hands. And, and Gary was pretty strict. And he so when you strict. prime, it's tobacco. We're supposed to take off like three leaves at a time. But my hands are not that coordinated. So sometimes it was three. Sometimes it was four. If I saw a snake, there was like <laughs> ten where there was yeah. nothing done. Um, but no, it, it was good times. We had such a good crew. Uh, so who was the creative mastermind with all the pranks you guys pulled? <laughs> pranks. I don't know. I think boredom, early hours. Okay. Um, and so somehow me and Eddie ended up involved in a lot of them. But I know Johnny Froze was not innocent. There yeah, was a few others yeah. that uh, that yeah. definitely played yeah. a part in that. And I know Randy Lowen was there. I'm trying to think of who Just else to was name all a there. Few. Yeah. Yeah. Tom it's Younger a was a part of the crew. There's a lot of people oh, yeah. underneath it. Oh, yeah. man. Oh, yeah. No, it was 100%. And and I, I'm just, I'm so glad I, I didn't get fired early on because I was just not that good. I worked in a strip room early on. This is okay. information nobody cares about. This is awesome. But this was how yeah. I started my tobacco career. And those were great jobs. I wish they were still available for my kids. I'm not a big smoking guy. but So what do you mean by strip room? Jobs. Strip room? I think it'd be I know, appropriate to clarify <laughs> so that. That's, when you're <laughs> that's what we always found so funny, right? Because we're boys. And especially at that age, being able to walk into school, yeah. being like, I was a stripper all summer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> so my parents probably didn't find it as funny as I did. But um, so when the tobacco comes off, the the trees, <laughs> trees, plants, stocks, plants, yeah. stocks um, it gets dried and then it goes through a sorting process and they call that the strip room. And I have no clue why they call it that. I always wondered why they called it that too. But they sort it and then you bail it and then it would go from there. Back in the day, it would go when the Imperial plant was still open in Elmer, then you'd ship it there. And so I was the bailer. It was good. It was good. And being a boat driver is when you knew you made it big. I never made it to boat driving. Yeah. Boat driving was a dream job. <laughs> but anyways, I, we and digress. I digress too. So yeah. how, how I got involved with the Malhide Athletic Center. Yeah. The reason why I wanted to join the board is because of what you guys did with the Family Central. That was really inspiring. And we really felt your heart in the community. So that was the main reason why I joined is because of the people. Mm. And then through that, met Paul and a few other board members that are so incredible. So if anything, I feel like the branch manager position has blessed me more than I've been able to bless others because mm -hmm. I would not have met all these incredible people if it wasn't for that. Right. So my goal is to give back the same amount that I've been taken, mm. uh, although I don't know if that's possible because I feel like I've been taking a lot. Right. Um, but the goal is to give it back as well and, and help others in the process. Right. Well, it was, it was interesting. I was on Saturday. We did a study here, men's study, and one of the things they're talking about was these seasons of life. Mm. And when you're in your 20s and 30s, that's a lot of taking. 
Right. Uh, that's where you're taking risks. You're trying to accomplish things. You're trying to figure out who you are. But yeah, once you get to kind of where, you know, me and Patrick are at, Patrick obviously hit his 40s before I hit my 40s. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> I thought Patrick was 28. I know. He is 28 at least once. And so, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, guys. All right. Um, but talking about now once you get to hear, like, there's a certain level of experience and you, there's a certain level of understanding. And even and we've talked about this a lot on this podcast. There was a lot of things that we did not know in our you know, early 30s about how, what it would take for a community to run, that the minute you start getting a little involved with, all of a sudden you're like, oh, mm. that's why it was called the Kinsman Park. Oh, that's why it was called the Optimist. Oh, that's what they do. And then behind the scenes, you see how many people it requires. And then that really, for us at least, our story is the same way. Like we were motivated by those people, guys like Justin Benner, where I just didn't know. Right. And I mean, there's tons of people. I thought the town put on the parade. That would make sense to me. Wouldn't that be like a town paid position right. thing? All right. Like I just, that's just always what I assumed. And so as you meet more people, I think, and that's why I think the heartbeat of this podcast is people because you can put together a good plan, but really it's the people who are going to either make this or break it. Um, and I know a couple of years ago, there was a lot of stats that volunteerism is going, going down mm -hmm. and, you know, our generation is not picking it up, but our experience around here is that there's some gems of people. Um, and so when you can surround yourself by them and you find yourself inspired, you know, and yeah, family central is something that we're, you know, we love and we're proud of that. We got to be a part of that, but that's one small piece, you know, and then that it doesn't include the corner cupboard and ECAP and all these other organizations you just try to find a niche, and that's kind of where the athletic center came up, that this was a need. It's not the only need. There's lots of other people doing lots of things, but this is one that we really felt yeah. compelled, especially during COVID, when that really showed how divided people actually are. And I, I think a lot of the division is still here. I, it's I would just agree. It's more hidden now. Uh, yeah. we, we've lost our big you know, issue, um, but it's still there. And so trying to find ways of how do we, how do we help our kids learn to you know, get along. Uh, with people that don't necessarily agree with them because that's part of what makes this country incredible is it's everyone welcome. Right. And so the idea of sports, what what impact has sports had? Like I'm disappointed with your hat. I just want to start there. And oh. I, I want to speak for all the peanut gallery fans. I, I know of one family, one of my coaches for baseball who would be proud of you. The rest of us are just we're feeling a little – Betrayed. I don't know if betrayed mm -hmm. is the right answer, but, it you know, it's – I think – any other team but the Yankees <laughs> or Dodgers. Dodgers are okay, no go either. Okay, would it make you feel better that I only paid $4 for the hat? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'm impressed. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay, do you like the Yankees? Are we a, are we a Yankees? Um, honestly, this was a fashion choice because I was looking for a black hat, <laughs> yeah. and there was a black hat. This was it. Uh, the price was right, and I bit. So basic poor assumptions on my part. And I'm sorry. I just, no. <laughs> I, I feel like, so because uh, right now in where we are, and I, I think I speak for all Blue Jays fans, right now we're still yeah. early enough in the season that we have hope. I would agree. Speak to us in June <laughs> or July. Well, yet, so <laughs> I could tape something over top. No, no, you're good. You're fine. Okay. Um, but sports, uh, did you, you said you high school sports were, were big in your life. Uh, what did you play and why, why would you make the statement that they were big in your life? Okay, so even backpedaling over to Mexico, we played soccer, baseball, and volleyball all the time. Mm -hmm. And that brought everybody together. It didn't know if you were wealthy or poor. Once our feet hit the field, we were equals. And we just played together as a team, used strategy. We got really creative in making bases out of jackets, or we would throw rocks together, and that would be a base. Um, so do, we, do, we were very in... Oh, sorry? Do you feel like... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, but go I, for I think it. it's an intriguing thing, because we. I think in Paul's episode, we talked a little bit about Bolivia, but... The difference in the way you view sports coming from, you know, if, and where we were in Mexico at that point, now it's a, it's very, very rich. But that would have been not third world, but it was pretty darn poor in a lot of the areas. But sports had a different meaning there than they do here. Do you, do you, did you would you agree with that? Like, was that your experience with that? I would absolutely agree with that. Because so where we moved from, um, I remember when we got plumbing. And I remember when we got electricity, that's how far behind in times we were. Um, so it's kind of ironic that my dad became an electrician later mm. on. Um, <laughs> so for us, sports was, it was a means of actually getting out and doing something together. Right. And we had to become masterminds, so to speak, because we had to find out a creative way to make a court or a creative way to make a net or have a creative way to make bases because we could just go and buy it. Right. Um, I think the closest store that we had was 45 minutes away. So we had to kind of make do with what we had and then work together. Um, 
We did our best in following rules, but we had to make up some of the rules. But even then, <laughs> we had like a council meeting and we all had to agree to the rules and that we would not break them regardless wow. if we got upset with each other or not. And then in school, that was just a bit of an outlet. So a creative outlet at recess time is to do something creative that bonded us together more. Because I think at least a lot of the conversation now around sports has to do with making it places trying to get scholarships, trying to get something. And I feel like a lot of that conversation has shifted over the last 30, 40 years. Because mm -hmm. even when you think about, you know, baseball back in the day, there, there was all these tiny little diamonds, right? Every community had a little diamond. Every community had something because that's just where kids went and played. And a lot of that is gone. And now it's all organized. And a lot of them, I mean, you're trying to make it somewhere. Um, and it's all intense. And, and so I feel like part of the conversation we're trying to have here is, if you take a step back, like sports were, yes, if you can make it somewhere in sports, super cool. Yeah. But that was never the goal of it. The goal was to get together and play something. So is that a trend that you guys have noticed that instead of sport being for the sake of a sport doing something fun and together, it's now a means to something? Is that what well, you're noticing? I, I think it's a couple of things. The one is most sports are becoming um, more for the rich. Okay. So because it is expensive. Oh well, well because like so if you play um, baseball for example, you play Elmer. It's pretty cheap, but you start going to any other center. By the time you factor in tournaments mm. and everything else, it's not cheap anymore because gas is not cheap, hotels are no. not cheap, yeah. um, and then there's a push towards always going to another level. And so you have some. Like, my, so I'm very familiar with baseball because that's where yeah. my boys are at, and they yeah. want to. They're all hoping still to at least play throughout their high school career at the highest level they can around here. Whether or not college happens or university, that's whatever. So they are trying to get to that next level. But then we played basketball. So Patrick and I ended up coaching in St. Thomas a couple of years ago. It's just as busy as hockey. And the cost. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I, I didn't expect that. Right. And then talking to some friends who were in volleyball. Well, it's all travel. It's all. And so what ends up happening is as it's gotten – more money poured into this and parents pour more money into it. As soon as one program starts going to three practices a week, everybody else has to too because otherwise you can't keep up. Yeah. Right? And so now you end up in a place where there aren't many options for just play. I would argue one of the very few would be, in our region at least, like our soccer program has never developed into anything more than just rec. That's it. You're going to come one night a week and that's it. Um, there's some stuff started by East Elgin um, Sports Academy there in Elmer. Um, but most of it is geared towards travel at this point. And that's hard for a lot of families. Yes, it is. And that's not really community building. And it brings more division because all of a sudden you're going to feel it that I'm not as wealthy as the Joneses. Sure. So my kid can't enroll because then they'll know I can't actually afford it. 100%. And, and I think some of that is just natural and that is what it is. I, I'm a big fan of rep sports. I think there's – if your kid loves it and you're there for the right reasons – Go for it. Go yeah. for it. And everybody's kid is different, right? I would never tell somebody that they shouldn't go into art if that's what their kid loves. Right. Your kid needs to have a passion. I think that really, really matters. But the bigger conversation is how do we build community? Because that's not community. So what we've built, so the team I coach, we have a close connection with the parents, the kids. I love it. But we're not building a bigger, broader community. You're not bringing everybody together. You're actually separating. You know, we have 12 boys on the team. You're separating the 12 arguably best baseball players in our region, that's what they're supposed to be at least, onto a team, and then they go do their own thing. So there is a space for that, and I think it's awesome. It is. I agree. Yeah. it's not community building. And so when I think we go back to what you experienced in Mexico or what, you know, um, Bill and Esther and them were experiencing in Bolivia, when they view sports, they view mm. it as a space where the entire community gets together. And this became their outlet, and it became their space. It was cheap. Yeah. Everybody was welcome. You weren't, you know, there was no, we're going somewhere. You just got together and have fun. Yeah. So how do you do that out here? How do you build a community out here? It becomes really the question. Oh, that, that is a tricky question. Well, I think you guys have a good solution for it with the Mac because, um, well, let's face it, real estate is expensive. Yep. So we don't have the yards that we used to have. So you don't have an option of going to someone's yard necessarily and starting a game. Parks, uh, they're heavily regulated too. You're limited to as to what you can do at parks. And then you have safety issues with... Well, the, the world is not a very kind place for young right. people, right? right? So then you have all of those factors. So you do need a safe space where you can get together as a community that you feel welcome at and you know you can go at any time. So I think the MAC can definitely fill that gap. 
Well, and I think there's a bit of a perfect storm because as inflation rises and this becomes more of a reality that because growing up, like this is only whatever, 20 years ago when we first bought a house, but buying a house was not something that was like a maybe it was, it was an expectation. Right. And your realistic goal was to own your own property and to have a good size property. That was realistic. Yeah. It wasn't like this weird, crazy dream. Everyone kind of, in our region at least, everyone kind of expects that. Well, now, because of your smaller living quarters, smaller yards, smaller everything, there's actually a really cool opportunity for people to go, you're going to need to leave your space and get together with people. And that's right? awesome for the mental health because you had to leave your house to actually right. go and do something productive. Yeah. Right? It takes courage to do that sometimes depending on where you're at in life. So I think that's a really cool idea. Okay. So forward from Mexico. I, that's I stopped right. you there. No, uh, no Mexico. Uh, so you played sports there yeah. and then back to high school. So in elementary school, I played basketball as well. Okay. Um, and we had an organization called High Tops. I don't know if you heard of that. I've heard of High Tops, but so, not the organization. Um, but we had some of our team members joined High Tops and it was like a public, not a public, public, but private basketball club. Okay. Uh, and you could always tell who belonged to the high tops because mm. they were next level. Right. They were definitely far more advanced in their skills mm -hmm. than, than the rest of us. Um, but I do remember that being very enjoyable. And I was bullied really bad in school. However, okay. when we stepped foot on the basketball court, she would not bully me. We actually worked together as a oh. team for the common good. It wasn't until after the basketball team and we we're back on school ground that, you know, the bullying resumed. But at that moment in time, we were, we were team members. Complete equals. Wow, you opened a huge door. I have like a hundred questions. I don't know which direction to take this. Oh boy. Okay, so so how, how do you how do you navigate that? Because I think you, you're hitting at one of the core questions. Because the idea of everyone getting together and playing is is fine and all, but it ends up often being, well, I still want to just get together with those that I like. How do you navigate playing on a basketball court with somebody? Like, how did you as a child figure that out? Uh, well, to me, I didn't think there was really a choice because she was a little bit intimidating and she had connections. Okay. Um, but at the same time, my desire to be on the basketball team was far greater than my fear of her. And then the other logic for me was, oh, there's lots of people around. She's not going to be brave and do anything. Right. So we're just going to make it work. So what was your experience with that then? Like you, you felt like that was a part of, did that remain a safe space for you? Basketball court always remained a safe place. She never did anything on the court. Uh, even when we were changing, she was very polite and, cordial um, but it was after but we did stand up to her and then it was the end of that so there's there's a part of that too you have to stand up to your bully sometimes you can't just right. take the peaceful route and say all right I'm gonna go tell an adult um, I actually got threatening with her not how how much is this being recorded <laughs> wow <laughs> no yeah, but you know what it was the best thing I ever did because I stood up for myself and she knew I meant business and she never picked on me since then. But even after that, anytime we played basketball, our differences were set aside and we never picked on each other. We didn't, we didn't bully each other. Well, I was never the bully, but um, yeah, we, we played together as a team. Okay. Well, that's very, very cool. What, um, when you think of life lessons, like do you, was there stuff that you feel like being on that basketball court, if you had not had that, not to say that basketball is the answer, but if you hadn't had that safe space, do you feel like you could have gotten to that conclusion and eventually found the confidence to stand up for yourself? I don't think so. I think sports definitely filled my confidence because, you know, joining a team, you're overcoming a fear, fear of rejection, fear of not making it, fear of making yourself look silly in front of other people. Um, so even just doing that, you're breaking a barrier already within yourself and you get confident. And then as your skills grow, your, your confidence increases, your respect for the sport, you start to take care of your body because you're understanding that suddenly if I have a licorice before basketball, I have a crash 20 minutes in. Whereas if I eat something healthy, I had energy the whole time. So then you also learn to make wiser food choices in the process. Um, and then you're less concerned about body image because you're feeling healthy. You feel good about yourself. You have healthy endorphins kicking up, you're feeling great. I think all of that helps so that you can get the confidence to stand up for yourself when you need to, but then also have the confidence to make choices later on that may be intimidating because you did overcome something intimidating already. And I think one of the things that when I hear that story now at this age, kids don't become bullies because they want to become bullies. Right. And so, yes, we want to stand up for those who are bullied, but you often go, okay, well, what yeah. What is it in you? And sometimes kids are just jerks, right? And adults are the same, where it's not really 
I don't want to excuse everything with something, but usually at that age, if you are a bully, there is very rarely not a reason that you've become that type of a person. Agreed. In this case, she did have a rough home life. We didn't know about that. Right. But we saw glimpses of it at basketball tournaments. So, But then got... the, the healing of her being out there probably was just as powerful. And it'd be curious to have you know her share her story. Right? And go, How did I get to that place? Because again, at some point, our, our, our culture, I think, sucks in a, a lot of ways in terms of conflict because we all hate it so much. And we have the ability to hide behind screens. And we get passive aggressive. That's a 100%. common Mennonite trait, right? Yeah. yeah no, we're, we're real good. <laughs> we're Smile <laughs> on her face as her heart is angry. Yeah, yeah That's yeah. a Christian way to do it, right? Yeah. We don't have road rage. We just give people the, the finger with their heart <laughs> and smile. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so after high school, are, are you still in any sports now? Like, is this still a part of your life? It is. So my husband and I, we play baseball. Okay. Um, Eddie plays baseball? Eddie does. Is he's he he's amazing. Like, uh, for real. He's... I feel like that's what you're supposed to say. Like, is no. he actually? I haven't seen him play. If you are watching this, honey. No, <laughs> <laughs> no he legit is really good. Um, <laughs> um, he When he was younger, he actually had an opportunity to play in Japan. Oh. So, no, he's definitely. How does definitely... one even get that? You know what? I feel like you should have him on your podcast and ask because I don't know if I know all the ins and outs or the strategies that he used or what path he took, but he has been playing ball since he was quite young. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm i speechless now. Like I had the opportunity to play church ball. That's as high as I got up. So <laughs> Well, I yeah, mine was like rec league too. That's okay. about as high as I'm getting. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe one day, Eddie, if you're watching, you can, you can join uh, the, the peanut gallery. Big, big deal. <laughs> but I'm a firm believer that um, sports really build your character. And the reason why I say that is you think you're a good person, you're very patient, but then when something doesn't go your way <laughs> on the field, um, that is, you're showing your true colors at that moment, like your reaction to situations. Um, and then you have a choice in how you want to react to it, right? You can be upset and then take the victim mentality where life is out to get you or you move on and learn from it, right? Yeah. So I think that's really big. I don't believe everybody should have a ribbon for participation. I do not believe in that philosophy whatsoever. Um, yes, sports should be very community and everybody should have the opportunity to participate. Yeah. Um, but as you do progress and you do want to be more competitive, it's nice to have that avenue because again, you're just building your skills. You're, you're having to learn to work with other people who are different, but at the same time, uh, when we play ball, like we'll play with all walks of life. Like we have LGBTQ plus members on the team um, and we get along super well with them. We have business owners, we have factory workers, we have farm kids. Like it doesn't matter. We have all different nationalities and it doesn't matter. Right. Like nobody sees that part. We just right. see players and we're trying to be strategic with who plays where right. and then have good chemistry on the field. Right? right. So I think it teaches you a lot of good life lessons. Right. I think the, the healthy space to just be human together. Absolutely. Yes, there's yeah. a space for, and I've always thought it was, in, this is going way off the rails here. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with this issue another day. <laughs> I just think it's intriguing that we identify people on who they're sexually attracted to. Like, there's so much more to a human than that. Yeah. Like, I just, it, it's so crazy to me that it that's, is, right? that's the way we're like, well, if you're, but that is, uh, we, we are digressing and going all over the place here, Sorry. which is good. But I think it is, it's valuing the human. And yeah. I think one of my big challenges to the Christian community has always been, and, you know, as a pastor is we are so big on the right to life and yet we don't value life nearly mm. as much as we should. If, if right to life means so much, then a human being should know they're valued because they're a human being. Right. Right. And so in our belief and understanding, we would say that each human is created and designed by God and is known by God. And so how dare we, you know do some of the things that you see people in the Christian community doing in terms of demeaning in, in people. In the name and, of Christianity, right. yeah. So it's one of those things that, again, we we when people ask us, they're like, well, is this a church thing? Well, no, but I, obviously we're motivated by our beliefs. Everybody yeah. is. And so it absolutely is, but our, our belief big is, is much more we want to see the humanness in each other and we want to be able to enjoy recreation together. And then at the same time, provide kids the opportunity. Yeah, we want some high-end programs yeah, to run out of here. Absolutely. We want to create some places or if you want to excel to the next level, we want to offer that. Yeah. And so, anyways, I think we are we are um, as long as we <laughs> have wanted to be. Okay. Um, it has been awesome. Thank you for agreeing to do this. I know this was not something that you. Out of my comfort zone. Yes. No. Thank you for but, having me. But honest, sincerely, um, bless you guys for doing this. Your vision is powerful. I really do think you'll be very successful. And it is an honor to be on the board and I will do my absolute best to help where I can. 
but definitely I have been so blessed already and I can only imagine the impact that this will have on the community, but also the surrounding communities. Awesome. Hey, well, thanks for your time. Thanks for watching. Uh, Eddie, good to see you. Um, <laughs> other than that, uh, we'll see you on the next one.